So let's start here on page number 110 with chapter 5. Now, this whole chapter, chapter 5, is about encumbrances to real estate. Now, what is an encumbrance? If you look at page number 110, right underneath the word encumbrance, I would write the words burden on title. Because that's what an encumbrance is. It's a burden on the title. Now, a burden could take the form of a lien, which is a money encumbrance, or non-money burdens also, like easements, for example, or encroachments. So we're going to start with encumbrances that involve money, and those are liens. Now, one thing I do want to show you, just so you have a good understanding of why this is important, burdens on title can, of course, affect the ability of a property owner to sell their property. If you have a property that's over encumbered or too many burdens, it might be a short sale, for example. So if you have a house that's worth, let's say, 500000 but you owe $850,000 on the property, it may be over encumbered, which would require that you negotiate with those lien holders to release their liens and accept less than the amount owed as settlement in full. So as a real estate agent or even as an investor, it's important to have a good understanding of how encumbrances affect title. And this way, hopefully you'll be able to know whether something's a good deal or a bad deal, or if a deal can even be put together based on the encumbrances on that property. Now, one type of encumbrance on page 111 that's important for us to know is a lien. Now, right underneath lien, I would write the words money encumbrance on page 111. So liens always involve money. Not some of the time, not most of the time, but all of the time, if a lien is on real estate, it involves money in some way. Liens are money encumbrances. Now think of a lien, in any kind of lien. How about a property tax lien? You don't pay your property taxes, you're gonna get a lien on your property. Now, let's analyze that for a second. If you look at page number 111, you will see on this page four bold vocabulary words. You'll see the words specific, general, voluntary, and involuntary. Now, a specific lien, remember we're talking about property taxes here. Let's look at what a specific lien is. A specific lien is a lien that only affects one identified parcel of real estate. So if a lien only affects that one identified parcel, the lien is said to be specific. Now if the lien affects all property of an owner, the lien is said to be general. So specific liens only affect that one parcel. General liens affect all property of an owner. Like a general lien could affect your house, your car, your boat, your plane, your motorcycle, your bank accounts. Everything that you have is jeopardized by a general lien. Whereas a specific lien only affects one identified parcel of real estate. Now let's look at property taxes. Now for the past few years, of course, we've been in a down real estate market. Prices have come down. Aren't there people that had like 20 houses that are letting a few of them go in foreclosure? Yeah. So let's say somebody has a main house in Beverly Hills and they bought three houses in Riverside. They're going to let those houses go in foreclosure. Now, if you're going to let your home go or your real estate investments go in foreclosure, are you probably going to be continuing to pay the property taxes on those properties if you're going to let them go in foreclosure anyway? Probably not. Now, you're going to have property tax liens on those three houses in Riverside that you stop paying the property taxes on. But is that property tax lien also going to affect your house in Beverly Hills? The answer is no. Property tax liens are specific liens. They only affect that one identified parcel. Now, don't confuse property tax liens with income tax liens. If you don't pay the IRS your income taxes, not your property taxes, but your income taxes, could the IRS put a lien on your house, your car, your boat, your plane, your motorcycle, your bank accounts, everything? Yeah, everything is affected by a general lien. Now, what's an example of a general lien? IRS liens, general liens. What's an example of a specific lien? Property tax liens, specific. Income tax liens, they're general. Now, look at the next two on page 111. We have voluntary liens and involuntary liens. A voluntary lien is a lien that is freely accepted by the property owner. Anytime you freely accept a lien, the lien is said to be voluntary. Anytime you freely accept a lien, the lien is voluntary. An involuntary lien, on the other hand, happens by operation of law. Now, you might hear that and say, voluntary? Why the hell would anybody freely accept a lien? Why? There's no point. You freely accept a lien. There's only two kinds of voluntary liens that you freely accept. Mortgages, and in California, lenders don't make mortgage loans anymore. 
they use a document called a deed of trust. But in practice, they're similar. I mean, they're a way to borrow money to buy real estate. Now, is there a law that says you have to have a mortgage or a deed of trust on your home? No, there's no law that says that. You freely accept it, you hope for it, you pray for it, you pray that you get that good interest rate so they can put the lien on your property. Why, that lien is a voluntary lien. So mortgages and trust deeds, they're voluntary. Every other kind of lien is an involuntary lien. Think about the IRS. If you don't pay the IRS, do you have to phone up the IRS and remind them to put a lien on your property? No, they have the right to do that by law. If you don't pay your property taxes, do you have to call up the state and remind the state of California and the uh, county assessor to put a lien on your property? No, they have the right to do that by law. So voluntary liens are ones agreed to by the property owner. Involuntary liens happen by operation of law. So these liens move in two groups. They're either specific or general, and then they're either voluntary or involuntary. So let's look at property taxes. Property taxes are a specific involuntary lien. They're specific because they only affect that parcel and they're involuntary, why? Because they happen by operation of law. So property taxes are specific involuntary. How about a mortgage or a deed of trust? If I refinance my house in LA, is that also going to affect my house in Victorville? No, a mortgage or trust deed are also specific liens. They only affect that one identified parcel. Now, are they specific voluntary or specific involuntary? They're specific voluntary. Mortgages and trust deeds are specific voluntary liens, right? You freely accept them. How about income taxes? Income taxes are general, right? Specific or general, they're general. They affect everything, they're the IRS. You don't wanna mess with them. And they're general involuntary. The IRS has the right to lien your property by law. So what about a mechanics lien? You might've heard of a mechanics lien before, what's that? Now, is a mechanic scene where you leave your car too long at the mechanic and they you know, put a lien on it? No, a mechanic scene isn't that. A mechanic scene, in this context, is where somebody provides labor or services or material or equipment to improve or preserve the value of a property. If unpaid, they have the right to file a mechanic scene. So anybody providing labor or services or material or equipment to improve or preserve your property's value they have the right to put a lien on your property. That lien is called a mechanics lien. So let's say you have a house in San Diego. You hire somebody to put a new roof on that house in San Diego. You stiff them on the bill, you don't pay. Do they have the right to file a mechanics lien on that house? They do. Now is that mechanics lien also going to affect your house in San Francisco? No, a mechanics lien like property taxes, like a mortgage is a specific lien. It only affects that identified parcel of real estate. Now, is it specific voluntary or specific involuntary? It's specific involuntary. You don't have to call up that contractor and remind them to put a lien on your property. They got the right to do that how? By law, right? So mechanics liens are specific involuntary liens. Now notice all these liens we've talked about. Mechanics liens, property taxes, income taxes, mortgages, trust deeds. They're all have to do with money. Property taxes, you didn't pay them. Income taxes, you didn't pay them. A mechanics lien, you didn't pay them. A mortgage, or did you trust. You borrowed money. So liens on page 111, that's why you wrote money encumbrance at the top of 111. Liens 100% of the time involve what? They involve money. Liens are money encumbrances. And then they could be specific or general. Specific only affects that one property. General, it affects all property of an owner. Voluntary liens you accept freely, and involuntary liens happen by operation of law. Now, another example of a general lien is a judgment. God forbid if someone sues you, could that lawsuit affect everything that you have? Theoretically, yeah. So that judgment is a general lien. Now, what about general involuntary? It's general involuntary, right? You don't have to phone up that plaintiff and remind them to put a lien on your property. That judgment can affect everything that you have. Judgments are general involuntary liens and they happen by law. How about an attachment? An attachment is also a general involuntary lien. What's an attachment? A pre-judgment attachment is like, if I'm suing you and it looks like I'm gonna win and I know you're rich, my fear is that you're gonna start selling off assets like you're Michael Jackson, you know, transferring stuff to everybody to make it look to the world like you're poor. That way when I sue you and I win, you're gonna tell the court you have no money and you're not gonna pay me. So a court could freeze your assets 
to satisfy an impending judgment, that's called an attachment. A lot of hair, a lot of hair on it. This is nasty. Could an attachment theoretically affect everything that you have? Yeah, it could. Attachment's general. Is it general voluntary or general involuntary? General involuntary. That attachment gets created by law. So here at the very bottom of page number 111 where it says mechanics liens, I would write four words at the bottom of page 111. I'd write the words labor, services, material, and equipment. So again, what is a mechanic scene? A mechanic scene is a lien that's placed on a piece of real estate anytime someone provides one of these four things to improve or preserve the value of a property. If I provide labor or services or material or equipment to improve or preserve your property's value and you don't pay me, I have the right to file a mechanic lien by law. Now, is that mechanic lien going to affect everything you have? No, it's not. It's a specific lien. Mechanic liens are specific. They only affect that one identified parcel of real estate. They're not general, they're specific. Now, are they specific voluntary or specific involuntary? They're specific involuntary. If you don't pay that contractor, you don't have to phone him up and remind him to put a lien on your property. He's got the right to do that by law. So I would write mechanic liens at the bottom of 111. Hopefully you wrote labor, services, material, equipment. And I'm also hoping that you wrote specific involuntary at the bottom of this page. Mechanics liens are specific, they only affect that one parcel, and they're involuntary because they happen by operation of law, specific involuntary. Now, a lot of people ask, hey Karthik, do I need to necessarily need to be a contractor in order to file a mechanics lien? No, I don't need to be a contractor to file a mechanics lien. Again, anybody providing labor, services, material, or equipment. Now, what that means is, look at labor. If I'm a contractor, could I file a mechanics lien? Yes, clearly. If I'm a contractor and you don't pay me, I can file a mechanics lien. Labor. What about services? What if I'm an interior designer or an architect? Could I file a mechanics lien? Yeah, I could file a mechanics lien. I'm, in, I'm, I'm, I'm providing a service to improve your property's value. How about material? Let's say that I own a brick supply yard. You come to my yard, take two pallets of brick from me, use that brick to line your pool, and don't pay me for the brick rental or for, pay me for the brick. Could I file a mechanics lien? Yeah, I could file a mechanics lien. I provided material to improve your property's value. What, if, what about equipment? What if I own a crane rental company and you come to my yard, take a bunch of cranes for me and tractors, use that equipment on your building and don't pay me for the crane rental or the tractor rental? Could I file a mechanics lien? Yeah, clearly I could file a mechanics lien if I'm not paid for my crane rental. So again, anytime someone provides labor, services, material, or equipment, to improve or preserve a property's value, if unpaid, they could file a mechanics lien. Now, the only time you do need to be a contractor to file a mechanics lien is if the work itself required a contractor's license. And of course, in California, that threshold is $500. So if you hire me, I'm not a general contractor, to remodel your kitchen, and I remodel your kitchen for $55,000, I probably need a contractor's license to do that. If you don't pay me, I can't file a mechanics lien generally because of the scope of work that I did. The scope of work I did required licensure. Now, if you look at page number 112, you'll see all these little black squares on page 112. What all these people have in common, what this list has in common on page 112 is that everybody on this list is providing either labor, services, material, or equipment to improve or preserve a property's value. Hence, they could file a mechanics lien, a specific involuntary lien. Now, here's something that a lot of people think about. Let's say I remodel my house. Bill's 100 grand. The contractor is a general contractor. That general contractor is going to hire subcontractors to do the work, right? Or at least some of the work. Now, if I pay the general contractor and the general contractor doesn't pay the subcontractors, could the subcontractors file a mechanics lien on my property? Yeah, they could. In theory, I mean, now as a homeowner, I'm saying, what the hell? I paid my bill. My general contractor turned out to be a deadbeat. Why should I be punished? Why should my property have a mechanics lien? Now, what you would want on the bottom of page 112 probably is something called a payment bond. And you'll see this in bold at the bottom of page 112. A payment bond is basically like insurance for the job. So if that contractor stiffs the subcontractors, the subcontractors could get restitution from the bonding entity. It's like insurance anytime you have a larger project. Now, if you went down to Walmart or Starbucks or 
wherever people go, 7-Eleven, and you just tapped the guy in front of you on the shoulder and said, hey, got a quick question. I'm so sorry to bother you. I hired somebody to paint my house, and I don't have the money to pay him. What do you think is going to happen to me? Now, how many people do you suppose at Walmart or Target or Starbucks or wherever are actually going to look you in the eye and say, you know what, you'll probably get a mechanic's lien on your house? Now, very few people are actually going to know what that word means unless you're in construction or in real estate or you're a contractor. That's really the only reason why you'd even know what the heck a mechanic's lien was. For this reason, at the top of page 113, mechanic's liens require something called preliminary notice. Now, what is preliminary notice? Preliminary notice is the contractor telling you, look, I'm going to do the work, but you should know that if you don't pay me, I have the right to file a mechanics lien on your property. That's called preliminary notice. So again, what is preliminary notice? It's notice from the contractor to who? To the homeowner or building owner that the consequences for non-payment are the filing of a mechanics lien. Now, do you think this preliminary notice should be given at the beginning or at the end of a transaction? At the beginning, right? You want to know this early. So if you get in bed with this guy and they don't pay you, or you don't pay them, rather, he has the right to file the mechanics lien on your property. Now, for the test, note that the preliminary notice on page 113, preliminary notice must be given no later than 20 days from first furnishing labor, services, material, or equipment to the job site. So no later than 20 days from first furnishing labor services, material or equipment to the job site, the contractor has to tell you that the consequences for non-payment are the filing of a mechanics lien. Now, candidly, most contractors don't wait until that 20 days is up. They give it to you early. They give it to you most likely right on the estimate, right? You get somebody to give you an estimate to put hardwood floors in your building. On the estimate, it'll say estimate, you know, 19,500. Then in small letters at the bottom of the page, it'll say, under the California mechanics lien law, you are hereby advised that if unpaid, I can file a mechanics lien. Sign here. That's preliminary notice. So again, preliminary notice is notice from the contractor to who? To the property owner that the consequences for non-payment are the filing of a mechanics lien. This is notice from the contractor or labor provider or service provider or equipment provider to the homeowner. Now here's what might freak some people out as they start thinking about how these mechanics liens work. Let's say that you own a shopping mall. And let's say that I'm C's Candy, a wonderful candy shop. And let's say that I'm C's Candy and I'm gonna rent some space in your mall. Now I'm not gonna buy that unit, I'm not gonna buy the mall, I'm just a tenant, I'm gonna pay you rent. Now we're gonna negotiate something. I'm gonna say, look, C's Candy is gonna pay you $7,500 a month, that's the rent. And you say, okay, and we sign a lease. You're going to hand me the keys. Now, as C's Candy, when I get the keys to my new shop, it's not going to look like a C's yet. I got to bring in painters and tile people and, you know, refrigeration. And I got to bring in all sorts of people to make it look like all the other C's Candies. Now, here's what you're worried about if you own the mall. I, C's Candy, am going to hire a tile company, call it XYZ Tile, to lay that black and white checkered tile inside C's, inside C's Candy like all the C's Candies throughout state. Now, is that tile company providing labor, services, material, or equipment to improve or preserve the value of your mall? Yeah, all of the above, right? Labor, services, material, and equipment to improve the mall. Now, if you're the owner of the mall, you're kind of worried a little bit because if C's Candy doesn't pay those material suppliers or vendors, they could slap a mechanics lien on the whole mall. Now, a lot of people say, well, that's not fair. The mechanics lien should just be on the portion of the property that C's Candy is there for. The reason that doesn't work that way is because all those walls are fake. Those walls separating C's Candy from Forever 21 and Forever 21 from KB Toy Store. I don't think there is a KB Toy Store anymore. I'm showing my age. But the point is those walls are all fake, right? It's all one big parcel. That's the mall. So if you own the mall, you're probably not dumb. You know that if C's Candy doesn't pay those contractors, the contractors could slap a mechanics lien on the whole mall. So to protect yourself, what do you do as the mall owner? You post a document called a notice of non-responsibility. And by the way, you'll see this at the top of page 114. You'll see this notice of non-responsibility. Now, what is a notice of non-responsibility? This is notice from the owner 
to the contractor. So this is kind of backwards, right? That preliminary notice I talked about was notice from the contractor to the owner. This is notice from the owner to the contractor, notice of non-responsibility. This is a notice saying, look, you as the owner of the mall don't know who the hell any of those contractors are. So if those contractors aren't paid by C's Candy, the contractors can't file a mechanics lien on the mall. You are saying you are not responsible for payment, hence the term notice of non-responsibility here on page number 114. So again, what is a notice of non-responsibility? It's a notice that's posted on a property anytime, for example, a tenant has authorized work done on a property without the landlord having to pay for it. This is why, staying with the shopping mall thing, this is why anytime you go to a mall and you see a new store about to open, 100% of the time, you'll always see an eight and a half by 11 notarized piece of paper right at the front door of that, or right at the entrance of that shop. If you go up and read it, it says, it doesn't say welcome sees candy, it says, Notice of non-responsibility. Attention all equipment providers and material suppliers and contractors and laborers. The owner of the mall, XYZ Mall Ownership, Inc., does not know who you are. We didn't hire you and we're not responsible for paying you. So if our tenant doesn't pay you, you are not allowed to post, you cannot post a mechanics lien on our property. So this must be posted on the property and recorded at the county recorder's office in the county that the mall is located in or the property is located in within 10 days of knowledge of the construction. So don't confuse the 10 days on a notice of non-responsibility with the 20 days on a what? On a preliminary notice. And by the way, you'll see this on page 114. You'll see this gray box. If you didn't authorize the work done, you must post and record within 10 days of knowledge of the construction. That's a notice of non-responsibility. Who does this protect? Protects the property owner in the event that, for example, a tenant has authorized work done that the owner of the property is not going to pay for. Now, one thing that I do want to share with you about liens in general on pages 114 and 115 that I think is pretty important on 114 and 115 because it's on the test, but it's not in the book. And I, it's, it's useful to just maybe make some notes here on 114 or 115. The first thing about liens that we should know is that there is this concept called lien priority. And you might want to write that down, that those two words somewhere on 114 or 115, lien priority. Now what is lien priority? Lien priority is, which is the order in which claimants are paid in the event of default. So for example, my house might have, let's say, a child support lien, a mechanics lien, a judgment, an IRS lien, and three trustees on it. A mess. Now, if I walk away and I let that property go in foreclosure, all the people that had recorded an interest in my property are going to have their hand out, right, wanting to get paid. And they're going to be fighting and scrambling, trying to get paid first. Now, the order in which these guys get paid is known as lien priority. So it's the order in which claimants are paid in the event of default. What's that called again? It's called lien priority. Now, lien priority for most things in life is determined by the date and time of recordation. So a couple things we should write. First thing that we should write is the definition of lien priority. What is it? Lien priority is the order in which claimants are paid in the event of default. That's lien priority. Now, how is lien priority determined for most things in life? Lien priority is determined by the date and time of recordation. First to record, first in write. First in first in time, first in line. You know, this is sometimes called the race of the diligent because everybody's running down to the county recorder trying to record their lien because the earlier they record, the more senior their lien position is. There are two types of liens, however, that don't work according to that date and time of recordation principle. One of them is property taxes. Property taxes actually do not work according to the date and time of recordation. Property taxes jump to the front of the line. Property taxes and special assessments, they get paid first. They get in front of everybody, even in front of the IRS. The IRS gets in line just like everyone else. So property taxes and special assessments, like a mellow ruse bond, which we talk about in chapter 11, or a bond created under the Straight Improvement Act of 1911, these guys get to jump to the very, very, very front of the line. They get paid first, even in front of the IRS. So how is lien priority determined for most things? date and time of recordation, but not property taxes and special assessments. They're even, they're right neck and neck, and they're in first position on a property. 
The second kind of lien that does not operate according to the date and time of recordation concept are mechanics liens. Mechanics liens are effective when the work starts, not necessarily when the lien is recorded. So if, for example, work starts on a property in April, but the mechanics lien shows up in November, when you look at where that is in lien priority, the contractor gets to go to April. They get to go retro to when the work started. So three concepts here for the exam. Number one, the order in which claimants are paid in the event of default is known as lien priority. Who's always in first position? Property taxes. Mechanics liens get to get their place in line based on when the work started. All other liens, date and time of recordation. First in time, first in line. First to record, first in right, and that's lien priority. And the reason I wanted to bring that up here is because mechanics liens are an exception to that rule. Remember the contractor or equipment provider gets to go back to when the work started, not necessarily the date the lien was recorded. Now here on page number 115, couple things that we should look at here on page 115. They are judgments and attachments. Now I talked about these a little earlier on in this chapter, judgments and attachments, but do me a favor here. Next to both of these, I would write the words general involuntary. Both judgments and attachments are examples of general involuntary liens. They're general liens because they affect all property of an owner, and they're involuntary because they happen by operation of law. Now we know what a judgment is. A judgment is a final decision by a court. If someone sues you, God forbid, and you lose, could that judgment affect everything you have? Yeah, a judgment is a general lien. It affects all property of an owner. An attachment is also a general lien. Now what is an attachment on page 115? An attachment is where it looks like you might lose a lawsuit. A court could order the freezing of your assets to satisfy an impending judgment. That could affect everything that you have. That's an attachment. That could affect everything that you have, right? It's freezing your assets. That could freeze your bank accounts and uh, you know, all sorts of stuff. So both judgments and attachments are both examples of general involuntary liens. Now let's move out of the world of money encumbrances like liens and into the world of non-money encumbrances. Now remember, an encumbrance is any burden on the title. Now there's two types of encumbrances. Some involve money, some do not involve money. Remember money encumbrances are liens like property tax liens, income tax liens, judgments, mechanics liens, etc. We're going to move out of that here into non-money encumbrances also called easements. An easement on page 116 is an example of a non-money encumbrance. Easements do not involve money at all. Now all an easement is, is an easement is the right to cross over someone else's property for access to your own. The right to travel over another's property for access to your own is known as an easement. Now think about this. Let's say you got two houses right next to each other, call them property A, property B. Let's say the only way that B can get home is to cross over A. You've seen that, where there's like a house in the back. The only way the guy in the back can get home is to cross over the front house. That right to cross over someone else's property is known as an easement. Now, you'll see this here at the bottom of page number 116. You'll see the term easement appurtenant. Now, remember, you might remember this from chapter two, an appurtenance is anything that runs with the land. So let's say these two properties are next to each other in Redondo Beach. The guy in the back can travel over the front house. If you sold that property in Redondo Beach, either of them, front house or back house, and you moved to the Bay Area, would you take that easement with you to the Bay Area or would it stay with the property? It stays with the property. It is appurtenant to the land. That's why at the bottom of 116, easements are appurtenant. They run with the land. They're tied to the real estate. They are not tied to the owner. They're tied to the property, not to the owner. They're said to be appurtenant to the land. Now, two words I would also write at the bottom of 116, because they're important for the test, are the words ingress and egress. Ingress, egress. Those words, ingress and egress, have to do with entry and exit. Now, isn't that what an easement does? Doesn't an easement allow ingress and egress to the property? It does. An easement allows ingress and egress to the property. It allows you to go in and allows you to come out. So that access is ingress and egress, and that has to do with easements. So 
If the question on the exam were to say, the words ingress and egress would have the most relevance with regard to what? Your answer, easements, right? Ingress and egress are easements. They let you go in and let you come out. Easements are also appurtenant to the land. They're tied to the property. They are not tied to the individual owner. Also, easements, broadly speaking, easements are encumbrances. They are non-money encumbrances. Now, if you look here at the top of page 117, and you'll see this in the diagram on 117 too, there are two parties to a basic easement. There's the dominant tenement, and there's the servient tenement. Dominant and servient. Now, if you think about those words, dominant and servient, which one just sounds better? Dominant, right? Dominant just sounds better. It sounds like you're domineering. It sounds like you're powerful. It sounds like you have dominance. That's most people, a lot of people think that's good. Servient just sounds not so good. It sounds like you're servient, subservient, slave in some way. So the dominant tenement, I would write on page 117, the dominant tenement benefits from the easement. The servient tenement is the burdened party. So the dominant tenement benefits. The servient tenement is the burdened party. So in my story, front house and back house, the back house is the dominant tenement. Why? Because the back house gets to walk all over that front house. The front house is the servient tenement. The servient tenement gets walked on by the dominant tenement. So again, the dominant tenement does the walking. The servient tenement gets walked on. So again, the party that benefits in an easement is the dominant tenement. The burdened party is known as the servient tenement. And you'll see this at the middle of 117, that back house, lot B in that diagram, lot B is walking all over lot A. B travels over lot A to get home. Lot B is the dominant tenement. They get to walk all over the servient tenement. A is getting walked on by B, hence A is the servient tenement. But if you think about this at the bottom of page 117, the right to travel over someone else's land. Doesn't Southern California Edison Pacific Gas and Electric, uh, the cable company, don't these companies have the right to come onto your property and read your meter, for example, in the case of the uh, gas company or the electric company? They do. That's actually a type of easement. It's called an easement in gross at the bottom of page 117. So right at the bottom of 117, underneath easement in gross, I would write the words utility company. The utility companies have easements in gross over all of our land. They have the right to cross over our property. Even the right of the phone company to like string wires over a subdivision or the right of the water company to lay underground pipe through our land. Those are easements in gross. So the right of, so some people say, you know, man, I'm gonna pay cash for a house. I don't want any encumbrances. Well, hell, you're at least gonna have some encumbrances or easements from the utility company, unless you're on like well water and solar panels and you know some sort of diesel generator out in the middle of nowhere, you're at least gonna have an easement in gross for the utility company. And that's also a type of encumbrance. So if you and I were neighbors and I asked you for an easement, what are the odds that you would give it to me? Probably pretty slim. You're not gonna give the guy next door an easement over your property. So the natural question is, well, if nobody would give the guy next door an easement, how are these easements created to begin with? Frankly, most of the time, as you'll see at the top of page 118, most of the time easements are created by express grant, where the dominant tenement gets granted the easement by the servient tenement. The servient tenement just says, go ahead, use my land. Now, in, as a matter of practice, how this happens is at the time that the subdivision is filed, I mean, think about this. Do developers like cramming a bunch of property together? Of course, they love it. And at some point, the developer owns the entire, let's say, 100, acre, uh, 100 acres of land. The developer is going to say, you know, I bet we can fit one or two more houses way in the back back there, behind that front house. We'll just put, throw two in the back. And the guys are like, well, how are, we, how is that, how are those back houses going to get home? No problem, the developer says. We'll just give the back homes an easement over the front house. That's how these get created. They're created by express grant, where the servient tenement expressly grants the dominant tenement the right to use their land. Now, again, as a matter of practice, when does this happen? This happens at the time that the subdivision is filed. Because the developer is the owner of all those parcels, the developer just grants that back house, the, the dominant tenement, an easement over the front house. So how are easements generally created? On page 118, they are created by express grant. 
where the dominant tenement gets granted the easement at the time that the subdivision is filed. Now, other times on page 119, an easement by implication of law and an easement by necessity. Now, these two terms are very, very similar because California doesn't allow a landlocked parcel with no access. So you couldn't have like one property in the middle, a bunch of properties around it, and no access. The middle parcel would have an easement by necessity or it would be implied by law. These two terms are related. You would have an easement by necessity, which would then give you, by implication of law, the right to travel over the most convenient route in order to get home. So again, how could easements be created? One way on page 118, which is candidly the most common way, easement by grant, express grant, where the dominant tenement gets granted the easement by the servient tenement. Another possibility is here on page 119, an easement by implication of law or easement by necessity. You can't have a landlocked parcel, and if you do, that landlocked parcel by necessity or implication of law is going to have uh, an easement over the most convenient way to get home. Now, another way that an easement could be created is here at the bottom of 119 and top of 120. It's called an easement by prescription. And this is an important easement to know for the exam because there's lots of questions that the test could ask you about how a prescriptive easement works. Now, I would start this on page 120. At the top of 120, you'll see these four black squares. Do me a favor, right to the left of that in your notes, I would write the word nacho in a vertical line at the top of page 120. N-A-C-H-O, in a vertical line. Now, nacho stands for notorious, that's the N, adverse, continuous for five years, hostile, and open. So, notorious, adverse, continuous, hostile, and open. These are the five requirements in order to get an easement by prescription. Let me give you a couple examples of this. Uh, several months ago in the Los Angeles Times in the uh, real estate section, it's a front page article. One of our students sent it to me and I just, I loved it because very rarely will you see an easement by prescription on a relative basis. Typically, most easements are gonna be created out by express grant, right? By express grant, maybe implication of law or necessity, but this is kind of a rare one. Now, what happened is there was a very successful developer and it was featured in the LA Times. This developer had developed, uh, according to the article, a couple of Ritz-Carltons throughout the world. And I mean, the guy was smart. He knew what he was doing. This guy buys several acres in Los Angeles County and wants to build houses. Now, either he knew and didn't care or he didn't know, but long story short, there were a group of hikers for years that had hiked through this private property. Now, this guy starts building and eventually these hikers file a lawsuit claiming they have a prescriptive easement. Now again, a prescriptive easement, I would write a little note, again, I know you wrote this in Nacho, but I'd write it again, the word hostile, maybe at the bottom of page 119. A prescriptive easement is a hostile easement. It is created even though you don't necessarily grant the easement to the other guy. It's created by notorious, adverse, continuous, hostile, and open use for five years. Now again, back to this hiker case. So in this particular case, these hikers have been using this land for like a really long time definitely more than five years. This developer starts to build houses or you know, files the subdivision plan and the hikers come out of the woodwork claiming that they have a prescriptive easement. Hey, I've notoriously, adversely, continuously, hostily and openly used this land for access to my own property or for hiking or for whatever for at least five years. The developer in this case was forced to open up access to these hikers based on the fact that they have a prescriptive easement. They've not showed the land for at least five years, and now they have use of the property through a prescriptive easement. It's hostile to the owner. You see this a lot in urban areas, like in downtown Los Angeles. You'll see streets like the sidewalks that are really, really, really wide. Now, typically the sidewalk is owned by the city, but in a lot of urban areas, a portion of the sidewalk is actually owned by the, the, by, the, by a private property owner, right? By the, by the lot owner. So I don't want, if I own a lot in downtown LA and I know that you're walking across it or you're walking through it or you're walking on a portion of it, I don't want you notoriously, adversely, continuously, hostilely and openly using my property for at least five years 
And then maybe I change my development plans and you claim that I got to change my plans because you have an easement by prescription. So what we find in a lot of these urban areas is on the ground, you'll see these bronze plaques every you know, 20 or 30 feet. And the bronze plaque says, permission to pass, revocable by property owner at any time. Now think of those words, permission to pass, revocable at any time. That means if you use my land for access, it's not hostile. I am giving you permission to use my land, but I am reserving the right to take it away. I'm giving you a license, not an easement. This is why a lot of people say, well, if I was that guy that owned all that property that I, um, in the Hollywood Hills that I was going to build on and those hikers wanted to come at me, I'll just put up no trespassing signs. A no trespassing sign in this context just makes it worse for you as a property owner because a no trespassing sign is only further evidence that the use is hostile. That's why these bronze plaques say permission to pass, revocable by property owner at any time. I am giving you permission to use my property. So again, most easements aren't created through prescription. Prescription is hostile use for five years. Most easements are created through express grant or maybe implication of law or necessity, but it is possible through hostile use over a parcel for at least five years to get an easement over the property, that's called an easement by prescription. Now think of this question here. What if the question on the exam were to say, permissive use, what does that mean? You got permission. Permissive use across a road would cause a prescriptive easement in how many years? Now this is a trick question. It's never. Permissive use would never cause a prescriptive easement. Now, hostile use, that would cause a prescriptive easement in five years. Permissive use across a road would never cause a prescriptive easement because by definition, the easement has to be hostile. It has to be obtained through hostile use, not permissive use. Now, a couple things about easements and how these easements get created and taken away and all. Now, we've talked about how easements can be created, express grant, necessity, implication of law, we just talked about prescription. But there are ways to terminate an easement. There's eight ways, and you'll see this on 120 and 121. There are eight ways to terminate an easement. Now notice, if you kind of skim through these on 120 and 121, what you won't see is one of the choices saying unilateral revocation by the servient tenement. In English, that means the guy whose land I have the easement over would love to be able to wake up tomorrow morning and say, look, you can't use my easement anymore. They would love to say that, but they can't. If you give someone an easement, you better be damn sure that you want to give them that easement because if you decide you don't like them so much tomorrow, the easement ain't going away. Easements are not revocable. And really quickly, I want to bring your attention to page 122. You'll see this gray box on page 122 that says license to use land. Right next to the word license, I would write the word revocable. A license by definition is revocable. Now what that means is, think of the word license. What happens if you're Michael Jackson's doctor and you kill the guy? What'll happen to your medical license? It'll be revoked. What happens if you're a lawyer and you steal money from your client? Your law license will be revoked. What happens if you have a real estate license and you discriminate against people? Well, your real estate license will be revoked. So any, t or what, your driver's license. What happens if you get caught drunk driving four times in two days? What will happen to your driver's license? It'll be revoked. So any time someone uses the term license, they are talking about something that by definition could be revocable. An easement, on the other hand, is not revocable. So if you look at the top of page 122, the principal difference between an easement and a license is that a license is revocable. You can take a license away, you cannot take an easement away. An easement is not revocable, so and a license is. Now, if you come back then to pages 120 and 121, you'll see this list of eight things on pages 120 and 121. These eight things are eight ways to terminate an easement. Again, one of these isn't gonna be the servient tenement wakes up one day and says, ah, you can't use it anymore. You can't do that. If you want to take it away, give the guy a license, not an easement. Now, if you look at page 120, check out number one. One way to terminate an easement is express agreement of the parties. 
meaning that the dominant tenement has to sign a quit claim deed. The dominant tenement has to sign a quit claim deed over the property that you want, right? Over the property they have the easement on. So if I'm in the back house, you're in the front house, one way to terminate an easement is the back house owner, I'm the dominant tenement, I would be the one that would sign the quit claim deed. Now look at number two, lawsuit. A quiet title action can be brought to terminate an easement by court order. Look at number three, abandonment of a prescriptive easement. Now, abandonment of a prescriptive easement. Now, what this means is, remember, the prescriptive easement took five years to get. You better make sure that you're using that easement at least once every five years. Because just like the prescriptive easement took five years to get, if you don't use it at least once in five years, it'll go away. But remember, non-use won't terminate every easement. It'll only terminate an easement by prescription, right? So, for example, an easement in gross, like Southern California Edison has, that's not going to be affected by non-use. An easement that you got by grant or implication of law, if you go to Spain for 10 years and nobody's using that easement, you still have it when you come back. It's just that if you not show someone else's land through notorious, adverse, continuous, and hostile use for five years, then I better make sure that I'm using that easement at least once in five years or it'll go away. So will non-use terminate an easement? It will, but the use would have first, the easement would have first had to have been prescriptive. How about the bottom of page 120? Or estoppel. Now, estoppel, this is a this is a word basically that has some uh, French roots. And long story short, what estoppel means is you are stopped from denying something. You are stopped from denying something. So I'll give you an example of this. If I've been out with the same woman romantically twice a week for five years, even though we've never defined our relationship, do I probably have a girlfriend? I probably do, based on estoppel. If I try to deny her, estoppel would say, no, wait, stop. Your actions make it look like you have a girlfriend. You are barred from denying the relationship based on estoppel. Now, how does that relate to easements? Well, let's say that I have an easement over your land, and I needed it. It was by necessity because maybe I was, at the, I was the last lot, and I was in the back house, and there was nothing behind me. Now, all of a sudden, five years, six years, ten years later, the city's built a bridge or another alley, or there's a road now, and there's another way for me to get home. Now I don't need to use your land. So I say, you know what? I'm going to not use your land. I don't tell you anything. I just say, you know, I'm not going to, mentally, I think, I'm just going to use this other road. I don't want to bother this poor neighbor. I'll just use another road for access. If I use that other road for like 15 years, never use your land ever for like 15 or 20 or 25 years, I'm not saying that I would win or you would lose or whatever, but if you built a big wall preventing me from having access to your land anymore, I haven't used it in 20 years, and I try to sue you to force you to take down that wall to give me access again, you're at least gonna try to get me on a stop You're gonna say that my actions over the last 15, 20 years the fact that there's a new road behind us and the fact that I never use your land anymore may bar me from using your easement anymore. At least that's, that's going to be your argument. So through estoppel, an easement might be terminated. How about the top of 121, number five? The dominant and the servient tenements merge. If, they're, if they become one property, right? Same ownership, you don't have an easement anymore. I mean, do you need an easement to go to your garage? No, it's all one property, right? So if the dominant and the servient tenements merge, this could terminate an easement. Number six, destruction of the servient tenement. If the servient tenement gets destroyed, there's, it's not possible to use the road anymore. That may terminate the easement. How about number seven, adverse possession. So adverse possession is a way to get title. Again, you're getting title to a property. That may terminate an easement. Number eight, excessive use. If I can prove that my use is unwarranted, I'm just you know, using your land 55 times a day just to kind of harass you, I'm driving next to you in a big diesel Hummer truck or a big 18-wheeler excessively just to harass you and be a nuisance. This also may cause the easement to be terminated. So again, these are eight ways to terminate an easement. Big lesson here, though, for the exam. Can the servient tenement, the guy being burdened, the guy encumbered, the person whose land I'm using, can the servient tenement wake up tomorrow and just say, nah, dominant tenement, stop, you can't use my land anymore? No way, right? If you want that, you give them a license, not an easement. Are condos good investments? It's a great question. Are condos good investments? Now, the benefit to a condo 
is that you have a homeowners association that looks after some common areas and sets some rules for the community. The downside to a condo is that you have a homeowners association that sets some rules to look after some common area and the community. So the homeowners association basically follows something called CC and R's or covenants, conditions, and restrictions. Now, if you look at the very bottom of 122 and the top of 123, you'll see the term restrictions. Do me a favor, right next to restrictions, I would write two words. I would write the words private control. Private control of real estate is accomplished through deed restrictions, also known as CC and R's. Now, at the top of 123, you'll see the definition of CC and R's. CC and R's stand for covenants, conditions, and restrictions. Now, we should probably define what some of these words are, so I'll, we'll get started here. If you look at 123, do me a favor, at the middle of the page, right near where it says covenant, I would write the words weaker than a condition. A covenant is weaker than a condition. Next to condition, at the bottom of 123, I would write the words stronger than a covenant. So a covenant is weaker than a condition, and then of course, by definition, a condition must be stronger than a covenant. So, and a restriction is either one. A restriction is just a broad term for private restrictions on real estate. I'll give you an example. Let's say that you live in a condo here in Los Angeles, and there's a rule that says that you can't swim in the condominium pool after 10 p.m. Now, does the city of LA care if you're swimming after 10 p.m.? No. That's the homeowners association. There's rules called CC and R's or covenants, conditions, and restrictions. And these CC and R's are gonna dictate what you can and can't do in your condominium complex. For example, some condo, some condo complexes or planned unit developments have a rule that says, for example, you can't change your oil in your garage or in the carport area. They think it looks a little pedestrian, right? It just looks a little low class to change your own oil. But if I like to, you know, a couple times a year, have a beer and get under my car and, you know, change my own oil, well, it's probably not smart to drink and then climb under your car. But the point is, is that if that's something that I do to relax every, you know, every three or four or five months, I'm going to want to know that if I buy a condo in that complex, I'm not going to be able to do that. That's against the rules set forth in the CCNR. So I'm going to build a test question here just in case you get this on your exam because it might be on the test, but it's not in the book. On page 123, you might want to make a little note. If I buy a condo, am I probably going to want to know what the CCNRs say? Of course, right? So the question might go, the purchaser of a condominium, a purchaser in, the, in a condominium project would be well advised to request which of the following? Number one, would you want a copy of the CCNRs? Of course, you're going to want a copy of the covenants, conditions, and restrictions just so you know what you can and cannot do in that property. The second thing you're going to want is the homeowners association's financial statement. Now, why is the financial statement important? You're going to want to know that that homeowners association is liquid, that they're solvent, that they have money. If they have $63 in their operating account, you're going to want to know where the hell all that money is going, right? So we want the financial statement of the HOA. The third thing we want if we were to buy a condo is we want the homeowners association meeting minutes, the meeting minutes of the HOA, meaning for at least 12 months. So we want to know what are meeting minutes. Now that's what was talked about at the HOA meeting. Now, if the homeowners association's board of directors and their management company says, uh, you know, we, uh, we haven't met in like a couple years. Well, where's my money going? If I'm paying $300 a month or $400 a month, you guys haven't even met for a year and a half. Where's my money going? Or do you want to know if that rapist is still on the loose in the building? Of course. You're going to want to know what's happening in that community. So the three things you're going to want if you buy a condo, number one, you want the CCNR. Number two, you want the financial statement of the HOA. And number three, you're going to want the meeting minutes for 12 months so you know what's been talked about over the last year. Now, the reason on page 123 that next to covenant you wrote weaker than a condition is because if you breach a covenant, you're not going to lose title to the property. If you breach a covenant, you're going to get like fined, you'll get sued, you might have an injunction, which is like a formal court order to stop doing something. So you're going to have a, one of those three things happen to you if you breach a covenant. Now, if you breach a condition, much worse at the bottom of 123. 
Breach of a condition results in loss of title. When you breach a condition, you don't own the property anymore. The property reverts to the original grantor. Now, think about this for a second. Do you think most things in life are covenants or conditions? They're covenants. If I don't mow my lawn in my condo, am I gonna lose my condo over that? No. Worst case scenario, they find me, they sue me, hell. They might even mow my lawn for me and send me a bill, that little patch in front of my door, but I'm not gonna lose title over that because that's a covenant, not a condition. Alternatively, let's say that I, there's a rule that says I can't swim in my condo complex after midnight. I go swimming at 1.30 in the morning and I get caught. Am I gonna lose my condo over that? Of course not. I've breached a covenant, not a condition. So a covenant is weaker than a condition. A condition is stronger than a covenant because if you breach a condition, breach of a condition results in loss of title. And by the way, if a court could interpret something either way, like if it was kind of gray where something could be a covenant or could be a condition, 100% of the time, a court would much rather interpret something as a covenant because breach of a condition has such a harsh penalty. If there's any ambiguity or gray area, a court will always rather interpret something as a covenant rather than a condition. Now, if you look at page number 124 and 125, a couple things. If you look at page 125, you'll see figure 5.1, property maintenance standards. Now, check out 2A. It says all lots must be landscaped. Landscaping of every kind and character, including lawn, shrubs, trees, etc., must be trimmed and cultivated continuously to provide a safe, clean, and groomed appearance. This is part of CCNRs. In English, what do you got to do? You got to mow your lawn, right? Mow your lawn, make it look halfway decent. Now, if I don't mow my lawn or I don't take care of the shrubbery in front of my unit, am I going to lose my unit over that? No, right? Fine, sued. They might, you know mow my lawn for me and send me a bill, but I'm not gonna lose my property over that because that's a covenant, not a condition. Now, how thick are the CCNRs? My God, they're like, you know, theoretically, they could be in some instances like several hundred pages. So let's say that somebody snuck something into the CCNRs or they're old from like the 30s and 40s and there's a race restriction in there. Property may never be sold to women. Property may never be sold to minorities. Property must be sold to blah, 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 blah. Now, that in and of itself does not invalidate the CCNRs. The whole CCNRs are not void. It's just that particular condition or that particular covenant is no longer valid nor enforceable. Also, another illegal covenant or condition would be here at the middle of page number 124. You'll see the term restraint on alienation. Now, what does alienate mean? Alienate means to transfer title. So how crappy would this be? Look, I'll sell you my condo, but you can't sell it to anybody else unless I meet them and I approve of them. Also an example of an illegal covenant or condition. You can't have a rule that says that the next owner can never sell the property to the following, to anybody else, unless I agree or I approve. Totally illegal. Now, does that invalidate the entire CCNRs? No, the CCNRs, the rest of them are valid, it's just that particular covenant or condition is no longer valid nor enforceable, just like a race restriction would be. So the stuff that we just talked about, all those CCNRs and private restrictions and all that, those are again private controls over real estate. That has nothing to do with the government. Governmental control of real estate, you'll see here at the middle of page 126, is zoning. So zoning is the way that the government can control what we can and cannot do with our property. So again, private restrictions are accomplished generally through CCNRs, deed restrictions, covenants, conditions, restrictions. Whereas public controls, the way that the government dictates how property is used, that's generally done here on page 126 through zoning. Now, a couple more vocabulary terms I wanna share with you. One is at the bottom of 126 and top of 127. It's the term encroachment. So an encroachment is also a burden on the title. It's also a type of encumbrance because here's what an encroachment is. Let's say that I build a fence two feet over onto your property line. The vocabulary term for that is an encroachment. Let's say that I build a big skyscraper and eight inches of that skyscraper are on your property. 
That's also an encroachment. So an encroachment is any improvement, and when I say improvement, I'm not talking about this in a positive way. It's just any addition to the land. Maybe I have a tree, and part of that tree's branches go over onto your property line. That's an airspace encroachment. Maybe the roots of that tree go underground into your property. That's an underground encroachment. I build a little guest house, and a foot or two of that guest house are on your property. That's also known as an encroachment. So again, any improvement that extends onto a property is an encroachment. Now, the last thing I want to share with you from this chapter is here on page 127. It's called homesteads. Now, a homestead is something that protects a portion of your equity from unsecured creditors. So for example, let's say that you're driving along in your car and you rear-end someone, God forbid, and you don't have insurance and that person sues you. If you have a homestead on your primary residence, because you, you can only have one homestead at a time, when you have that homestead, a portion of your equity is preserved for you to prevent claims from unsecured creditors. That's known as a homestead. And again, you can't have more than one homestead at a time.